Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Ellen Robinson. He's the founder of Genetic Insights. And after facing severe health challenges, that he could not figure out, even after going to traditional and alternative medicine, Elwin turned to genetic testing, which he realized he had a lot of things going on. And so he literally figured out from his genetics, combined with some nutritional testing, what his main deficiencies were, and he worked to correct them. And so in this podcast, we're going to talk all about how he went from chronic fatigue and just not feeling great to thriving. And of course, the inspiration behind his company, Genetic insights. Now, here's the interesting thing. He is all about making genetic testing affordable, and he's using any, if anyone's had genetic testing before, you can use his platform to get even more dialed in information. Because what I hear from a lot of folks, you'll have things done and you'll, you'll get some info, but it's not entirely helpful. And in his case, he has specifically figured out what's needed to give you the most bang for your buck, if you will, in terms of genetic information. And of course, at the end of the podcast, we'll have a discount code if you want to try things out. But nevertheless, it's a great conversation. Ellen and I geek out quite a bit on genetics and just really finding solutions to help you optimize your health. All right. So let's introduce you to Ellen Robinson. Hey, health junkies. I have Elwin Robinson on today. He is the founder of Genetic Insights, and we're going to be talking about your genetics, but we're also going to be talking about using this detailed information to help you feel younger. So Elwin, welcome to the Health Fix podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm definitely interested in how you're helping folks feel younger. But before we get into that, I'm always curious about you know, what led you here? Because I I saw in your information that you had some severe health challenges and you tried all kinds of alternative medicine, probably saw a bajillion doctors um, Mm -hmm. and you weren't getting the answers that you needed. So what brought you to looking at your genetics? Yeah, I think, you know, you just said it in a nutshell there. (laughs) I could (laughs) could expand a little bit more. Um, uh, You know, I'll do do as short as I can. So, you know, my parents are both into health. my father, you know, I was on a strict macrobiotic diet for the first four years of my life, for instance. Um, my mother had cancer quite a few times. I think she had it four times and she had tumors several other times. Uh, and my father had uh, ME and chronic fatigue by the time I was a teenager. So I always assumed that I did not come from very good genetic stock, at least when it comes to health. Um and so they were really into health. I remember throughout my childhood, there was like supplements and herbs and weird looking foods, you know, for, throughout the kitchen and all the rest of it. Um, and so, of course, with parents like that, I rebelled. And throughout most of my teenage and 20s, I was, um, you know, smoking, drinking, doing drugs, eating chocolate all day and drinking coffee and, you know, generally um, not looking after my health at all. In my late 20s, I had a bit of a health crisis, a little bit of chronic fatigue, but I actually managed to overcome that. And by the time I was 30, I was feeling great. And long story short, you know, I ended up creating a he- several health businesses. Uh, one of them was education. One of them was like providing resources, specifically herbs, which I was into at the time. And all of that was great. And I was flying high, feeling wonderful, feeling better in my 30s than I ever had in my you know 20s or teens until I got to 39. And then suddenly I got this um, stabbing pain in my right side area. Um, It was uh, near where the liver is. And so I kind of assumed that it was some kind of liver issue with my, you know, kind of uh, TCM little bit background. And so first of all, I went to a mainstream doctor. They didn't have any answers. Did uh, MRI, CT, bloods, all that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, as you said, I went to all kinds of other practitioners um, because it was a pain issue. I also went to, you know, um, maybe it's a structural issue. So physio and acupuncturist and craniosacral and osteopath and chiropractor and all of that kind of stuff. None of that resolved it either. And this pain was pretty bad. And every time I ate, it was really bad. And so after a while, I got to the place where I think I was severely nutritionally depleted. Not just I think, I mean, I know I did testing later. Um, 
and I developed severe anxiety. I lost a lot of weight. I'm six foot three or 190 centimeters. I'm not sure what kind of you work in. <laughs> and uh, I got down to about 125 pounds. Um, and that's not, you know, dieting. That was trying to eat as much as possible. So I really lost a lot of weight, became very malnourished. And I was cold all the time. A lot of kind of classic symptoms of hypothyroidism, um, other than the weight loss, I guess, which I've, but I since learned that actually that is, you know, sometimes that is the way of hypothyroidism. Maybe 20% of people go the other way. They don't gain weight, they lose it. And um, yeah, I was in a mess and I tried lots of things, including functional medicine and no one really had any answers. And then I came across this genetic testing service. And what they said is, if you, if you've ever done a service like 23andMe or Ancestry.com, then you can upload your raw data. And within a few hours, we can give you all of this information and insight, which, you know, about all kinds of health issues. And by that time, I'd done a lot of testing. I'd spent thousands of dollars on my own private testing on top of, you know, what had been done by various practitioners and all the rest of it, trying to work out what was going on for me. And so the idea of being able to get all this information very quickly without any of the discomfort of having blood drawn and the inconvenience and all the rest of it was tempting um even though i generally i don't love the idea of genetics like originally ironically i was kind of that kind of person who believed like i am the captain of my own destiny i can create my own reality i'm not like you know the past does not dictate my future all of that kind of personal development stuff so the idea of genetics did not sit well with me but i thought okay i'm just going to try it and when I did it, I've um, I've never had an experience of going to a psychic and being blown away or a fortune teller or anything like that. But I would say this is the closest I got. Like the amount of things that it knew about me um, was mind blowing to me. And, uh, you know, we can go into details of that if you want. But then, you know, so it started to give some insights. And I, I'd love to be able to claim that just as a result of that, everything turned around. But the truth is, I still, afterwards, I validated a lot of what it told me with other testing to make sure that it was accurate um, and then took action on it. But it was. And so then, you know, uh, I got my wife to do it. I got my biz various business partners to do it. I got friends to do it. got employees to do it. It's one of those things, right? When you discover something that you love um, that's helped you, you kind of want to get everyone into it. And everyone kind of did pretty much. And yeah, again and again, I was blown away at how accurate it was. And also just like, seeing lots of different people's genetics like comparing oh okay so this person has this challenge and you can see that here and this person finds this easy right because it's not all about problems it's also gifts you know right. um and so yeah uh eventually i decided uh i need to make this more uh, available to as many people as possible this is life-changing this is transforming in all kinds of levels in the obvious sense of it helped me fix like a problem that no one else was able to work out but i think also because i fought back in 2013 is when I uh, gave my saliva sample to that company that then, uh, you know, almost 10 years later uh, was was um, that I used that same data. And I was like, if I'd have known back then, like it already knew that I was going to develop all these problems, even though I didn't have them back in 2013, if that makes sense. So I know that's kind of obvious in a way to a logical thinker, but just on a kind of intuitive level, like, wow, like. I could have prevented all of these things if only I'd have known that I had certain risks, that I had certain nutrients that I needed more of, that I had certain toxins that my body wasn't able to handle very well, and that I had certain hormonal imbalances. If I'd have like been aware that that was the case and resolved it, I never would have created all those problems. So that's like a second benefit of preventing. And then the third, I would say, relates to comparing myself to others, like I said, and um compassion i think is a big thing so i used to judge myself quite harshly because you know there are certain things that i was not good at compared to others and i would i say i also judged other people quite harshly because there were certain things that i was better at than them and to realize how foolish that is and to actually see it in black and white i know you know all religious and spiritual teachers have taught about you know don't compare yourself and you know um have compassion for yourself and others and you know all that kind of stuff but to actually see it oh yeah okay it is far easier for that person to do this oh it is far easier for me to do this and so therefore let me you know stop comparing uh, as if it's as if we're all born with a blank slate you know it's just not true we all have our um strengths and weaknesses that we're born with and uh, it's good to acknowledge that 
Makes sense. I mean, it, it, the, the comparison thing is such an issue, right? It, it is mm. hard. And so especially for women, um, when we mm. see someone dropping weight really fast and we have extra weight and, you know, there's that why me, what's wrong with me kind of thing. So having, yeah. having the genetic answers, I, I think for a lot of people helps, plus also narrowing down on what interventions are going to be the most important versus you know, hearing someone say, oh, this is magical for that. This is magical for that. And then go buy the supplements and be like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All dietary stuff, right? Like yeah. a lot of people trying to lose weight are following the you know keto diet these days, but 10, 20 years ago, it was kind of the opposite, right? It was the low fat diet. There's still some people, you know, pushing fruitarianism, whatever, like extreme low fat diets and, and they work, but for both people, right? Some people right. work by restricting all fats, they lose weight. Some people work by restricting pretty much all carbs, they lose weight. And so rather than trying to work out who's right and who's wrong, <laughs> one of the things I love about, uh, you know, the genetic insights is that it explains um, that these truths are context dependent. So within a certain context, uh, eating a very low amount of carbohydrates makes sense. Within another context, maybe eating a very low amount of fat makes sense. And there are all kinds of factors that could make that um, valid and true for different people. But one of them is genetics. You know, one of our most popular reports is the carbohydrate report. And it says some people are more hunter-gatherers. Their genetics are more like the hunter-gatherers who probably had limited access to carbohydrates. They don't respond very well to carbohydrates, and they certainly don't respond well to simple carbohydrates, you know, like sugars and stuff like that. And when they have that, the weight just packs on them, you know, very easily. Um, but some people are kind of what we call more farmer types, and they do just fine with uh, carbohydrates. For whatever reason, maybe their ancestors a long time ago were, you know, agri more agricultural, um, and they thoroughly adapted to carbohydrates, and they feel just fine even with simple carbohydrates. Because some people do fine even with sugar. Like, they don't put on weight. Um, there is some research showing it's even beneficial, which kind of blows people's minds. But uh, I think it just depends on these factors, right? It depends on, you know, not just genetics, but genetics, I think, is a really good starting place. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Now, of course it's no secret that there's a lot of different genetics companies out there and there's a lot of different variances in terms of pricing as well. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that when I looked at your website, it was like, it was very much like you were saying, if you have the 23 and me done, you know, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. So it seems that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like your, your company is much an entry level DNA testing company that builds off of what someone might have already had. So it's more cost effective to get the insights. Is that how I, how I, how I'm seeing things? Yes. I mean, I'd say that's accurate. Um, you know, I said, I, I use someone else's company usually to get my insights. So why bother creating my own company? And yeah, there were two reasons. First of all, the platform that I used, while it was good, is extremely complex. Um, I know for someone like yourself, I'm sure it would be <laughs> no big deal, but um, but maybe not for your clients, right? This is the, the the thing. And when I've shown genetic insights to doctors, like we have, uh, you know, MDs on board and stuff like that, they say, oh, you know, this is so helpful, not maybe, you know, from their perspective, I would maybe disagree that the information is innately better, but just that, like, I don't then have to write a report explaining the results to the client like it's already done for you. So that's one benefit. And yeah, the other one is the affordability. We we try to make it so that you get the highest quality information at you know the most affordable price possible. Um, so to go back to the entry level thing, like we do offer DNA and A kits. So for people who have never done the service before, we do offer that. That is fine. Uh, yeah. So comparing us to other people, so I would say one thing is that we do work with the full suite of SNPs that okay. are commonly you know done by all these ancestry services i i say that first of all to differentiate because i know that there are some companies out there i definitely don't want to name any names or you know be negative about anyone because i think everyone out there is trying to help um but there are some companies that will only test a few snips yes. and there are some companies who will only interpret a few snips so they um and i would say that's kind of like the more simple way of of approaching things which I understand why people do it that way because it really is much easier. Um, so with our company, the company that's behind us called Omix Edge, which is kind of provides the engine of it, there's several dozen full-time AI engineers and several dozen full-time research scientists behind it. So to do what we do is not that easy. The other option of what you can do is you can go to someone and you can take their raw DNA data and you can look at one SNP and you go, oh, you've got this one SNP 
and this means this. This mm -hmm. means that you know this enzyme is faster, this enzyme is slower. You're good at breaking down this. You're not good at breaking down that. And so because of that, we can say things about you. And so there are some services out there. You know, they'll focus on MTHFR, or they'll focus on COMPT, or they'll focus on um, you know whatever these kind of uh, becoming well known uh, genes because yeah. that's quite easy to do. What we do, for instance, like just as an example, our heart health report. Heart health, there's a there's a lot to it. There's a lot of genetic factors that could influence someone's ultimate risk of having, uh, you know, heart health issues. And so we will analyze over a million SNPs to come up with a risk score. So that's one of the differences. We're not the only company that does that. I'm not claiming that. But I'm saying most of them don't. They will just say, you know, oh, you have a tendency for... Uh, you know, uh, slow MTF, uh, HFR, and therefore you have a tendency for high homocysteine, and therefore you have a tendency for, you know, more likely to have heart health issues, something like that. So they're just looking at one SNP at a time and providing an interpretation. We are, because obviously a lot of the time SNPs will give contrary indications, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that's where <laughs> so you get real confused because you're like, wait, but it told me to take this, but then now it says I shouldn't do that. So then you're like, <laughs> so yeah what do you ha <laughs> give us a scoop on that like how you're taking everything so that you're not having the conflicting info well that's the several dozen engineers and several dozen scientists so the scientists are in charge of creating like a weighting for each of the snips as to how relevant they are like giving it a score is it you know is it high weighting is it low weighting is it you know strongly relevant is it mildly relevant and then the AI engineers are in charge of you know, creating and maintaining that engine that is processing that data and coming to a conclusion. And, and so in our reports, we do usually list SNPs. We'll, we'll give like a, a list. But, you know, for instance, with our heart health report, we're not listing all million SNPs. We'll just say, you know, maybe here's the top 20 that are most relevant. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, we give you that risk score and we give you recommendations going back to uh, you, you know, your point earlier, I would not have started a genetics business if all we could give you is risk scores. Because again, as I said, I'm kind of that kind of person who likes to believe that I can shape my own reality and create my own destiny and stuff like that. So the idea of, oh, you have this elevated risk of this disease and that's it. That doesn't feel very good. And I, I wouldn't want to do it if that's all we could do. But the, the, the majority of our reports, and again, this is one of the things that differentiates us from other companies, which is why I'm bringing it up now, is actually recommendations in most cases we can't always give recommendations because everything that we do is fda and ftc compliant like there is no it, uh, in my personal podcast i'm often conjecturing speculating you know stuff like that there's zero of that in our genetic reports everything has to be validated you see pretty much every sentence that's in our reports there is several citations to you know scientific studies so we don't give recommendations if we can't um because there is zero evidence there's zero you know scientific um validation that anything will help but in a lot of cases and you know most of the most important things like stress or like heart health or like blood sugar or uh, like weight loss or whatever it might be we give a lot of recommendations you know we give uh, dozens at least and every recommendation um is the the order is based on your genetics so different people will have a different order of recommendations um based on the genetics so again you know if you have an elevated risk for heart health issues or being overweight or whatever because of one SNP, then that might mean you get different recommendations than if you have an elevated risk of those issues because of a different SNP. It, does that make sense? So, yeah. you know, we do vary it like that. And we also give evidence and impact scores. Um, so, yeah, I think those are, <laughs> in a nutshell, some of the ways that we are uh, different from uh, other companies Yeah, that you may have used before. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Because I think, well, and, and here's like from the doctor's per, like side of it, right? When I order these for mm -hmm. a patient, a lot of times I'm left with trying to decipher what's going to be the best treatment protocol. Yeah. Because, yes, there's the percentages of risk scores and vague um, on some tests. And then other tests, we see a lot of repeat and contradiction, right? Like you yeah. were saying. And so then as a doctor, like I... I don't know what to do at this point, you know? So it sounds like from your testing, it's more guided. And and if you were to hand it to your doctor, that the doc can be like, oh, okay, now I see, you know, how this plays out. What about in terms yes. of like the mental health 
types of things, depression, anxiety, medications. Do you guys dive into that side of things too? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important. So I try and explain to people, there's no such thing as good genes or bad genes, you know? Now it's admittedly, some people have more high risk scores than others. So I guess you could say from that point of view, but the thing to clarify is it's certainly not binary, right? It's, right. And and I say this partly because I used to have this um, interpretation, as I said, you know, despite kind of wanting to believe that I was shaping my own destiny in reality, I thought, look, both my parents are very sick, probably I'm going to be very sick, you know, it's kind of a natural conclusion to come to. Um, but it's not actually accurate, right? And when I looked at it, a lot of the things had not been passed down to me from my parents, according to genetics, and, you know, and I didn't have any symptoms of it. So that's, so that's great. That's good. Um, but anyway, the way I look at it is this, um, we give risk scores, and as I say, sometimes we're able to give a percentage risk score, not always. So what I've observed is the very highest percentile risk scores. So that, that if the person has like top 1%, top 2%, they almost certainly have the issue or they have had the issue at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, like for me, for instance, when I looked at it, sinus issues, that was like, I'm the top 1 percentile. I've always had sinus issues. There's always some problem. And here's the point. If I am not perfect, so as soon as I haven't slept or have some stress or eat badly or whatever, the sinus is the first place that it will show up for me or one of the first places. Now, for someone else, it may be pain in the joints. For someone else, it may be a headache. For someone else, it may be digestive issues or whatever, right? And for someone, and I say this to say, for someone else, it may be depression. For someone else, it may be anxiety. For someone else, it may be, you know, bipolar kind of symptoms or, or borderline symptoms or, um, you know, whatever. Like, so that whenever I meet someone and they say, oh, you know, I know this person, they never get sick. They never seem to be unhealthy. I always say, well, what's their mental health like? What's their emotional health like? <laughs> and a lot of times, well, yeah, they're depressed or, you know, yeah, they, they've got obsessive compulsive disorder or whatever it might be. And I say, yeah, so that's just... They are blessed maybe physically in the sense that, you know, it doesn't show up for them in getting sick or getting tired or whatever or getting in pain. But for them, it shows up as depression. Like we understand these days that these issues, although neurochemical imbalances play some part in it, that probably a more primary mechanism that creates them um, is inflammation. And I would say, you know, behind that also potentially toxicity. And so when a person... Um, when a person who has a the hot when that's their highest risk that's where it will show up first and a lot of the time you know physically they may be fine and of course there are some people who are lucky who have both right <laughs> they, and there are some people who are extremely lucky who seem to have very little of those issues um but yeah so mental health is very important we treat it exactly the same you know to answer your original question so you know we give a risk score we give recommendations uh you know lifestyle recommendations dietary recommendations supplement recommendations um and it's it's one of my favorite sections. You know, we have we have our limitless package, which is every report, which is over 500 report, but we also have like 20 kind of much more affordable kind of subsections. And one of my favorite to look at, one of the first I often look at when I when I um just do a consultation where I run through someone's reports with them is emotional well-being. Because mm -hmm. I think that's like very, very important. And uh, you know, there's lots of evidence I'm sure you're aware of that um someone's emotional state and their uh, you know their mental state will affect their health very very significantly there's the placebo effect there's the nocebo effect um a lot of the time i tend to speak to people on the opposite ends of the spectrum i speak to a lot of health influencers who are really dedicated to committing to it and actually doing really well and i speak to a lot of people who are in the position that i was where they've literally tried everything and nothing has worked and you know they're, they're kind of hungry for answers so i kind of see both ends of the uh, uh spectrum and yeah, I would say that the people who are um, really struggling, it, it's it's definitely more helpful for them and the results are more accurate for them because they, um, so for instance, you know, everything where they have a risk score above, you know, like 90%, 95% or something like that, they they have almost certainly already manifested that issue right now or at some point. Whereas when I talk to influencers and people who've been very committed to their health for a long time, often it's like, it's the most difficult for me because like it's the least easy to show how accurate 
the system is because a lot of the time like well you have a very high risk for this and i've like, no, never had that never had a problem with that and so <laughs> it makes it seem like our system isn't very accurate whereas if i speak to the average person by the time they're age 40 i would say usually um when we look at the high risk scores they've already manifested you know the vast majority of them and they're very impressed wow like i was you know oh wow it's like you're psychic so accurate uh, but then i speak to people who've been you know highly committed to the health for 10 20 years and they haven't manifested a lot of their stuff and but then the interesting thing is when we look at the recommendations for those things it's like okay so you have a high tendency for depression you have a high tendency for sinus issues whatever it might be uh, urinary tract issues blah, blah, blah. and then we look at the recommendations and they're already following most of those top recommendations and have been for a long time and so again usually i can salvage it i can say look see it is accurate because you haven't got it but look you're doing most of the things that we that we would recommend that you do um so yeah sorry i'm not sure if i answered your original question there no it it helps to to think that through because I, i've seen the same when someone's really struggling, yes, we tend to see the correlations. In fact, I just did a genetics review yesterday and was like, and it was spot on for everything that this woman was experiencing. And yep. then, you know, yes, in the healthier folks, <laughs> you're like, well, this is a thing. But it also, you know, when we know that and we know we're already doing the, the stuff, it's like a good like, all right, great, keep going. Right. Yes. So I think for a lot of people, you know, making trying to make the decision of, of whether to do some genetic testing or not this is if you're feeling good it also helps you to confirm that you're on the right track too absolutely and and prevent i mean you know that's really the other benefit um and it's hard a selling point but i think as you said earlier um the point of compassion and understanding that you're different from other people and that you have you know strengths and and weaknesses that are um I, you know, I really love doing it, especially with several people, like couples, I do, you know, mm. surprisingly often. And it's so interesting to hear those conversations because you're just speaking to one person a lot of the time, like, you have this? And they're like, mm. but then when you speak it with, with their partner and they're like, yeah, you definitely do that. Or you definitely have that. It's like, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten. <laughs> so, like, I don't know if you do those kind of sessions ever, but they're always very interesting to me. <laughs> every Every so often. But yes, it is fun <laughs> because, yes, you do get called out by your partner on... <laughs> on a lot of things um that's the beauty of it um especially as you said those emotional mental you know kind of issues more as well um and yeah i just want to speak to that as well you know sometimes it's awkward like i did a recorded one of these and you know um the person had a, a you know a very high chance of having uh bipolar and i was like oh god you know that's a that's a tricky thing to say so i said it as diplomatically as possible and the person was like well, no, I don't. But, you know, my mother had that. And I know I have a strong um, tendency for that. And so I and we looked at the recommendations. And again, a lot of the time they were doing that. So I think there's definitely more of a stigma and a taboo about mental issues. And I feel more mm, reticent and reluctant to bring it up maybe with a person than if it's a physical issue. And I think that's not fair. That's because it's treated as if if you have a mental issue, it's your fault. And if you have a physical issue, it's not your fault. And I think that's a lot of the time why, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of a believer in some of the people who teach that a lot of the time emotional problems will manifest as physical issues. And uh, I think one of the reasons for that is because if you say, you know, I can't go to work today or I can't help you with the kids today or whatever it might be because I'm ill because I'm in pain then, you know, usually there's a certain degree of uh, compassion, understanding. But if you say, because, you know, I'm resentful about my life or, you know, because I'm sad, the person's like, what are you talking about? You know, snap out of it. You've got to get to work. You're going to, you're going <laughs> to, whatever it may be. So I think, you know, that is a big part of it as well. And so, you know, stuff like that does tell me that people think that mental and emotional issues are more your own responsibility um, which really doesn't make any sense because, of course, you know, as you and I know a lot of these physical issues, the person are completely self-created in, in some cases, obviously not completely. Otherwise, there'd be no point in genetic testing. But, you know, there's a significant factor in a lot of cases where the person has manifested it for themselves. So it doesn't really make sense that we treat people as if mental and emotional issues are their fault. But I think people are used to feeling that way. And so, again, that's where the genetics can be so helpful um, because it's like, uh, you know, I'll be honest, like um uh my wife like she you know she's given me permission to talk about this you know she has a higher tendency for depression than me and so i just i just didn't understand sometimes like 
why why are you like moping around why are you looking at the negative like I, it doesn't make sense to me you know, i know life can suck sometimes but you know just focus on what you can do and what you can control and all that kind of personal development stuff and to realize actually that's completely unhelpful advice and you know more importantly it's not addressing reality you know never mind it's not compassionate which is what some people might focus on which is also true but it's not even realistic why would a person who uh you know has a high tendency for depression why should they be treated the same as a person who has low tendency of depression when it comes to their outlook on life you know that's it, it makes no sense um if a, if a person who has a high tendency for depression is going to be equally happy as someone who has a low tendency that must be because they have a lot more support they you know they've done a lot more work on themselves they're, they're doing a lot more um just like if if two people are you know let's say an optimal weight but one of them has a tendency to be overweight that person who has a tendency to be overweight who is an optimal weight they've had to do a lot more to get to that point of being an optimal weight and so you know again back to that point of compassion i think it's you know very helpful again to have compassion for yourself and others with uh uh, by understanding this stuff. Yeah. yeah. No, it's an, it's an incredible, insightful view on things, which, you know, I don't think a lot of people think about per se, you know, we, like you said, society's a little different on, on how that works. Hey, Hell Junkies, wanted to tell you about my pal, Dr. Anna Marie Frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women. From anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones, as well as helping with sleep, she's got you covered. Plus, she has teas too. This day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happywholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not gonna remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. Now, with with the genetic testing and for the mental health, one of the other questions I had had is, do you guys l like name what medications would work best for someone or which ones wouldn't? Kind of like some of the other testing companies out there that docs will do to determine if they're going to put somebody on a particular medication or not. Uh, we don't do that yet. And that's because our system is very much client facing. So obviously, from a legal point of view, we can't be suggesting any kind of medications. Um we are working on and considering doing a practitioner only version um, where that would be available, uh, pharmacogenomics, but yeah, it's not available yet. Um, so far, our focus has really been on the consumer or practitioners like yourself, but who want to have like a consumer ready version, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, it, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense because, yeah, I think for, for different folks, there's there's different ways to to look at the different varieties of DNA testing out there and understanding, you know, what you're going to get with mm -hmm. each test. Because sometimes what I found is people have have purchased certain ones and they didn't get the information they wanted. And and that's where it's it's very important to understand. And, and what you guys have is you have different sections, I noticed, that kind of outline what kind of information folks are going to be able to glean from either the mini reports or the comprehensive report if they wanted everything uh yeah yeah we tried to split into categories first of all to make them more affordable so mm -hmm. if a person's only interested in why can't i lose weight or you know uh minimizing their chance of diabetes or cardiovascular health or emotional well-being or hormonal health or whatever we have like 20 then even though we try and make our system uh as you know user friendly and and you know what's the word non-expert friendly as possible if they get the limit list with over 500 reports, it's still just a massive amount of information. There's a lot of information in each report, 500 reports. So um, that's why we created those more affordable and um, result-focused uh, collections for people. But actually, I've been surprised at how most people have still decided they prefer the limit list. I guess they want all the information. Um, but 
you know, it partly is the affordability. I I don't think there's anyone who provides anywhere near the level of um, quality of information. You know, all the stuff we talked about earlier, where we're processing lots of snips, not just um, not just one at a time, like some companies for you know, like fifty five ish dollars. That's how much we uh, sell the um, uh, result focused collections for, and so uh, that's why we did those originally, just to make it you know as affordable and simple for people as possible. I mean, it's definitely affordable compared to the thousands of dollars of some of the the higher end companies. Now, in terms of sending off the DNA, of course, everybody, I, I always ask everybody I talk to that does DNA testing, you know, anonymity, I'm guessing, not going to China and going to a central lab that's running on different SNPs, like in, in a, I've heard that there's a very large one in Texas. Let's just say it that way. Um, mm -hmm. but are you guys going to like a major lab that runs the SNPs and you get the data back and then it's your engineers with the AI that put together the reports just so folks understand where their, where their samples are going, how it works. Yeah, exactly. And that lab does not have any, uh, information identifying your name or anything about you. So, you know, you get like an anonymous barcode with your uh, test kit, then you register it in our system. So, yes, our system has that information, but, you know, the lab doesn't. Um, you know, our company is a, a fairly small company, and I would say that's actually, uh, you know, a selling point from, our, from my point of view. Um, literally, the only person who has backend access to our system is me and our head of operations, Jessica. Uh, we have a extensive support staff, but we don't allow them to access the back end um, of our system. If anything comes up where that's necessary, then then uh, Jessica or I do it. And uh, obviously, we do all the usual stuff of you know uh, anonymized uh, passwords and two FA and you know IP checking and all that kind of stuff. But I think yeah, probably the biggest thing because. People can have you know, this huge list litany of security procedures that they say they have in place and you know they may well have it in place. But the problem is if you're letting thousands of people have access to a specific database, a lot of which are you know, maybe minimum wage workers, it would make sense that there could be some kind of slip at some point. And so that's why um, I, I, I personally think that's the biggest security risk. So people ask me under what circumstance could someone end up with someone who they don't want to end up with their data because of us. And I, I have to be you know, completely honest and transparent. The only time that that would happen is if some government body that has jurisdiction over us um, makes efficient threats and forces us to hand that over. That mm. is something that we can't avoid. Uh, you know, I'm not Julian Assange. I probably wouldn't go to jail for the rest of my life about this. But also, I don't think... Um, I think if a government body, I just want to you know point this out for people, if a government body really wants your genetic information, it's quite easy to get it. You know, they can get it from saliva, they can get it from blood, they can get it from urine, they can get it from stool. So if you've ever given a sample to any doctor or anything like that, um, you know, that information is potentially, you know, obtainable as well. Um, and so I would say that uh, if a government really wants that information from you, they're going to get it anyway. Um, so other than that, yeah, you know, our, uh, our system is, uh, you know, as safe as it can be, as safe as all the other companies. But as I said, with the distinction, there's literally only two of us who have backend access. And you know what, even though I want to access someone's information on the backend, the only way for me to do it is to reset their password, because there's still a little bit of a technical issue with clients. Um, and then they know that I've reset their password. So there's no way for me to access their information without them knowing that I've done so. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I think that gives some folks a peace of mind. I mean, unfortunately, yes, if someone, I, the information's out there, just like our other stuff, sadly. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, you know, yeah. It's, you know, it's more, do you want to learn about your health and prevent your, you know, things so that you can feel better? So let's move to a positive aspect of things, because I would love to hear from you um, in terms of all the SNPs out there, because there, there are a lot of them. What would be your favorite one pertaining to your information that helped you to feel younger? If you tie, if you could tie one on your end for you, what what helped you to feel younger? Which which one focusing on either preventative or maintaining or whatever? 
Well, just to clarify, do you want me to focus on SNPs? Because I can give an answer to that, but the more profound um, things that made a difference to me were not one SNP. They were based on a lot of different SNPs being processed and the risk score give, being given to me. So uh, which Let's would you do prefer? that. Let's do that. Okay. okay. Um, uh, so the biggest one for me, I think, was the report I got, which said that I had a... Um, that I have, you know, several SNPs that mean that my body is not very good at identifying and breaking down a specific heavy metal called lead. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result of that, it I had already done a hair mineral analysis test and it not shown any kind of, um, you know, metal toxicity. But as a result of that, I decided to do uh, a broad spectrum test that included, and as a result of that and other things, so there are also several nutrients that it said I had elevated needs for, which ended up being, you know, a really huge deal as well. Um, probably the biggest deal was choline. So I need more choline than, than the average person. Um, so I decided to do like a Nutrival test that tests both of those things. It tests nutrient needs and, you know, organic acids and also four levels of metals, but in the blood. And so I got that test back and I was actually amazed at how much was accurate, like specific amino acids. It said I had elevated need for like tyrosine, lysine. Um, I think there was another one. Isoleucine. All three of them came up on genetics that I had an elevated need. All three of them came up in my Nutrival that I was deficient in them, despite having plenty in my diet. And in the case of lysine, uh, Two years later, after supplementing with maybe over five to sometimes 10 grams a day of lysine, it still shows up that I'm a little bit deficient in lysine. So why I have such an elevated need for lysine, I'm not sure. But, you know, just to go back to that for a second, you know, lysine is very important for a million things, but it's often known to be especially important for the immune system. And obviously I had immune system issues. Um, tyrosine is known for a million things, but very important for making thyroid hormone. And it turned out that I was hyperthyroid very important for making dopamine and it turned out that I, uh, you know, had low levels of dopamine and elevated levels of prolactin. So there was like all of these things uh, to do with nutrients, but let me go back to what I started with was the toxin. So when I got that test result back, the result was 27.5 micrograms per deciliter of lead. Um, so the reference range that 95% of people are in is zero to three. Yeah, you're, you're smiling because you know what that means. Um, the level which the World Health Organization considers it to be acute poisoning and will uh, put you on chelation therapy in the emergency room is 45. So it's closer to the emergency room than it was, you know, a normal person. I, I know, you know, practitioners like yourself, the first question that they usually look at with lead is exposure, because, of course, um, it's actually very hard to get rid of lead in the body. And so the first thing they look at is minimizing your exposure to it. So um, I went to a normal medical doctor, an HSGP over here in England. Um, they didn't believe the results, but they redid the test and they found that it was equally elevated. I said to the doctor, I said, could this explain all my symptoms? Because some of the symptoms included abdominal pain, you know, anxiety, feeling cold, low energy, um, irritation, all these things that I've been feeling. And he said, yeah, absolutely. It could be that. Um, and so they decided to test my wife as well to see if it's exposure because we breathed in the same air roughly, drank the same water, bathed in the same water, eating the same foods, taking the same supplements and herbs, you know, roughly. And her level was one micrograms per deciliter, completely normal. So I don't claim that all of the difference between us is purely based on genetics. I think probably I had exposure a long time ago before I met her. Because uh, as I found out, you know, lead has like a half-life of 20 years and the body stores it in the bones. But I don't think I had a crazy level of exposure to lead. And so I think that genetic factor was significant as to why actually it was low in my urine and low in my hair. So my body just wasn't finding it and excreting it like it should have been doing, which is exactly what the genetic report says was the case. And so... Um, as you probably know, I mean, is it possible to feel fine with 27? I mean, it is. I've seen studies and some people, they apparently don't realize, but I think they're probably fine from a mainstream medical point of view. They're certainly not optimal if the level of lead in their blood is that high. Um, and of course, you know, that in turn can create all kinds of other issues, including contributing to hypothyroidism, which I also had. Um and, you know, the two kind of go together because obviously when you're hyperthyroid, your body doesn't process things as quickly and, you know, whatever. Um, 
but yeah, so it's still not great. Uh, I'll admit, um, doctor, it's still six, so it's still double, you know, what it should be. Mm. But at least I got it down, you know, significantly, and yeah, a lot of my symptoms have got better, you know, right along with that. Um, the crippling pain issue I actually didn't put that down down to that in the end. Um, I actually put that down to you know, I was diagnosed eventually once I'd done a lot of discovery with uh, SOD, which is sphincter of oddy dysfunction, which is very unusual, especially in men, right? I think yeah. about 2% of the population have it and the vast majority of them are women, like 98%. Um, and so, you know, what can cause that? I mean, there's complicated hormonal issues. One of the things when you have SOD is that um, painkillers don't work. So your NSAIDs don't work. And then the opioids, which is usually the next step when NSAIDs don't work, actually make it worse, significantly worse. If you give someone an opiate who is in agonizing pain with SOT, they will suddenly be in screaming pain. It's really, really horrible. So that was one of the other challenges. I know a lot of people have pain issues. I think over half of people over 40 have some kind of pain issue. That's not uncommon, but it's pretty uncommon to have a pain issue that painkillers don't work on or actually make it worse, which is what I had. Um, and I actually believe that the root of this is cholestasis. Um, I realize cholestasis certainly doesn't always lead to that. There are other things going on, but I believe if I never had cholestasis in the first place, I never would have got SOD. And I believe that the root of my cholestasis was down to choline deficiency. So mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, I have a genetic variant that means that I need two to three times as much choline as the average person. Well, I had been eating a very choline deficient diet for a long time partly on purpose because you know i was eating a vegan diet for a long time but even before that, i never really liked eggs so i never had egg yolks didn't like liver there aren't really many foods that are high in choline other than egg yolks i would say that have significant amounts certainly not enough to meet the rda of someone who needs say double the normal rda because they have the genetic variant that means that they don't make very much themselves very easily mm -hmm. and so i think you know, having that choline deficiency for literally decades caused, you know, a pretty severe level of cholestasis, obviously other factors involved as well, but I think that could have been the root of it. And, um, and as you know, you may be aware, cholestasis is actually the root of a lot of different health issues, not just, um, not just SOD, that's very, you know, unusual in my case, but you know, whether it's heart health, or, uh, you know, cardiovascular health, for instance, that can often be related to cholestasis, where then some, of the, you know, too much of the toxins are not being dealt with the liver, and then they kind of backwash back into the circulatory system and start damaging the arteries and overburdening the kidneys and being deposited in the brain and all kinds of issues can start with cholestasis. So I could have saved myself so much pain and agony, I would say, if I've just made sure that I had enough choline that I had enough of these amino acids like tyrosine, which is the building block for thyroxine, which is necessary, you know, to, to not have hypothyroidism. Um, and I know that sounds crazy because if you look it up, is tyrosine, is tyrosine deficiency ever a cause for high, hypothyroidism? The answer of Google will be no. But I've actually seen this over and over and over yeah. again. People have an elevated need for tyrosine. Uh, interesting. You're the first practitioner I've met who recognizes that. It's very interesting. So, uh, have you seen that as well, that people have an elevated need for Yeah, over very and over again over and over Interesting. again yeah fantastic yeah. all right i'm going to start referring to you when the next time i make that claim i've met another doctor who's seen it yes uh, <laughs> i have seen it i have seen it over and over again i think it just depends on how you know how many tests like i like to test I, it's mm -hmm. you know so i think it just depends on what you're looking at too but yeah i've seen it over and over again plus my population is women over yeah. 35 who are you know trying to figure out why they're so tired so yeah <laughs> it's probably also that why i see it too <laughs> Yeah, it's not like it's an epidemic, but as you, it happens a lot, right? And as you say, people with chronic health issues, especially women, especially over the age of 35, especially after giving birth, it, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, it's that, that's probably why, but but it is, I mean, I see it over and over again. And and it's crazy because I keep going back to the fact that like a lot of what's going on is is mineral, vitamin, you know, interact you know how things interact just like you described with you know the lead building up in the system and it wasn't necessarily you know that you had some huge lead incident you know <laughs> that you can remember and i think that's oh common. i forgot one other thing in that regard sorry yeah. calcium i have an elevated need for calcium and i've been having a low calcium diet for a very long time because dairy had disagreed with me and other things are not very high so i calculated my my calcium intake was about 200 milligrams a day i think the recommended amount for the average person is a thousand milligrams 
for me, maybe 1,500, 2,000 because I had the elevated knee genetically. And as you know, when you have low amounts of calcium, you're more likely to absorb lead. So that could have been the other factor that led to it. So as you say, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, all of these like vitamin, mineral, amino acid, nutrient interactions, uh, they're so um, they're so key, I would say. And so, you know, my seven step rejuvenation blueprint, uh, which I created, you know, I won't go through all of them, but first step is genetics, understanding all the stuff we talked about. Second step is nutrients. And then third step is toxins. And then, yeah, fourth is hormones. You know, th that's that's the order, I think, that um, like these diseases often manifest in. Um, and I, I put it in, some people do toxins first, but I put nutrients first because I think if a person is opt optimal with level of nutrients, they're much more able to handle toxins. So that's kind of why I put them in that order. Wholeheartedly agree with you on that one. Yeah, I, I think unfortunately, you know, I've made all the mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. I've went right towards the toxins and trying to chelate first, went towards, you know, viruses or whatever and tried to kill that first and then went, you know, and, and it's funny, you go back to it and you're like, ah, oh, the basics. The yes, basics. <laughs> the building blocks, I like to call them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's good to have like that you notice that, that you paired with the Nutri-Val. I, I love the Nutri-Val. It's probably my favorite test to to really give a lot of information for somebody and and maybe that's why I've seen the tyrosine and and tryptophans and all the <laughs> aminos deficient as well and the lysine I you know like you had mentioned you were low in lysine I, I see that often I see mm. that often and definitely in the same kind of picture you had so I guess you do this long enough you start to get patterns and you see patterns. Yeah. I'm sure you've probably seen patterns in genetic information too the longer you've been doing it yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting to hear you say about the tyrosine. Well, what do you um what do you see with lysine? Is it like uh, chronic infections or is there other things? Chronic infections, chronic toxic load, you know, mm, much like what you described. Mercury sometimes is another one that I'll see pretty heavily on folks' mm. aluminum. And then you know, the whole kind of picture that goes along with the deficient minerals, selenium, magnesium, calcium you know, sodium, a lot of the, the basics that we could easily counter. Happen. Potassium is another yeah. one I see. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> There's patterns. There's patterns. We should, we should all be talking about these patterns to help people too, but I'm sure, you know, there's, there's exceptions, but yeah, the patterns are very interesting that have developed and, and I've, I've been able to kind of outline over the years and been like, wow. It does fit. Have, and <laughs> have you written them in a book or in a in a training series or anything like that? No. I'd like to interview you now. I'd love to. I'd love to learn from you about this. It's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I need to put it up into you know put it into. It's more like you know when you when you read through a lab and you're looking through mm -hmm. someone's multiple labs that they've done, you see the pattern. And and yeah. so yeah, I probably just need to put it to put it to paper since I haven't done it, but yet I have it in my head. Like when I see it showing up, I'm like. I bet that's it. Now, for me, because I, I've done DNA testing, I haven't done it as extensively as I should. I, I personally am going to should on myself on that one because I feel like it's the best way to back up, you know, and kind of have the two with the Nutri-Val and with the DNA because now you know. Like, yes. Real time and predicted or, you know, is happening, could be. Yeah, yeah. I see uh, one more, one more example. I saw someone with a genetic tendency for um, low uh, needing more glycine. Nutrival showed that they were low in glycine. They had anxiety for f over forty years. They tried every modality imaginable. Um, I gave them a load of advice. They hadn't got around to following most of it yet, but all they started doing is taking glycine. They said, "My anxiety is already down by fifty percent." Everything that they tried to do that, and 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 as you say, yeah, I think. The reason I like to do genetics along with the Nutrival, because you could say, well, the Nutrival already tells you what's the point. Well, for me, like a Nutrival is quite expensive to get a person mm -hmm. to do. It's quite a hassle. It's one of the most hassly <laughs> self-testing things you can do, you know. Um, so like, uh, you know, for instance, I'll, I'll tell this story of a business partner. Um, he is like totally in business, marketing, like he's working 60 hours a week minimum. He's got four kids. He's busy. This is the point I make. But he started to get to the point he was waking up in the morning and he couldn't drag himself out of bed. And he thought he had low testosterone. He was also very depressed, all these kind of issues. I say this because he's spoken about it in podcasts, so he's, again, he's given me permission. Um, and, uh, and I said... I, it sounds to me like thyroid, but, you know, everyone in my life seems to have thyroid. Maybe I'm projecting, I'm, you know, I'm seeing. So, all right. So I'm like, 
would you go and get a test? He's like, oh, far too busy. My doctor won't do it. They told me my TSH is fine. I'm like, okay, you have to go to a you know a hormone optimization doctor, not a normal doctor. He's like, okay, I'll get around to it. He didn't do it. And then I was like, ah, his genetics. So I got him to do a genetic test because he was interested in it from a business point of view. And we looked at his uh, thyroid result and it was uh, 99 percentile for hypothyroid. And I was like, look, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't sure, but th there's some definite evidence here. And he was like, I was like, you have to go to a doctor. And he's like, okay, then. I, I still don't think he ever would have done it if he hadn't had the genetic test first. Because the genetic test, all you got to do is spit into a tube. So he was able to do that, right? Doing all the, the faffing around with the blood and, and, the, and going to an office and all that was too much for him. But again, he did do it. He went and he found out he had Hashimoto's. So, uh, you know, basically I say that not only would he not be able to function if he didn't do it, but eventually, you know, he wouldn't even have a thyroid gland, right? It would be destroyed eventually by his own immune system. So that's an example to me of where the genetics was helpful. Maybe it's not a problem that you come across because people coming to see you are really highly motivated and going to do whatever you recommend, but more for the average person, um, <laughs> the genetic test is so easy to do. It's so inexpensive compared to something like a Nutravel. So it's like a very um, uh, good stepping stone in the right direction, I would say. And as you said, even going backwards, even if they've already done the Nutravel, it still is helpful to do the genetics as well because it's like, it's just, as you say, doubling, like confirming. But for me, it's been more useful to get them to do those more expensive and difficult tests to start with the genetics. <laughs> You know, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised because it is. It's a pain. You have to get your blood drawn or you're going to do a finger poke. And, you know, there, there's a lot involved in, in urine samples and sending it off. But yet with, with saliva, it's pretty dang easy. So I, I agree. I, I absolutely agree on that. And that, yes, even in my practice, even though people are motivated, you got to go with what's easy to start. And then for my my extra biohackers or bio tuners, if you will, then, yes, the nutri valve, they're all over it. So you know, it's it's all up to what someone's looking for and and what they're interested in, and and definitely your your genetic testing with the the genetic insights comes in at a price point that a lot of people can afford, and it's mm -hmm. not prohibitive. And and even how you have it broken up, I think that's really nice because say someone just needs you know right now they just need to know this. Great, you know, let's let's rock that and and go from there. So. Gosh, you know, I could talk to you for hours, no joke, and, and definitely <laughs> about all the details. But for the, for the sake of the podcast and folks listening, we better give them some info in terms of how to find you and how to get a hold of your testing and all of that jazz. And guys, we have a discount code too. We'll get you here in a second. But Owen, give us the scoop. Like, where can they find you online and also social media, things of that nature? Uh, yeah, uh, if you want to go to geneticinsights.co, geneticinsights.co, not .com, um, and we you can use coupon code HEALTHFIX, all capital letters, no spaces, HEALTHFIX, for 25% off. So uh, I'd say our lowest price point is $45, our highest price point is $197. So with that coupon, you're never paying over $150, and that's for limitless all the information. So again, affordability is you know very key to us. Um, as is support um so my rejuvenate podcast it's called on um youtube.com slash elwin robinson it's also on you know spotify and apple and all the rest of it but uh, my biggest audience seems to be on uh, youtube you can find me there and there's a uh, philyounger.net would be the last place uh we have genetic insights available on philyounger.net as well as you know supplements and uh different informational resources as well Ooh, good stuff there guys you guys check out the youtube channel for sure i i maybe stocked it a little bit for a while. It's good stuff. <laughs> <sighs> well, thanks for coming on and geeking out with me and all the good information you got for folks at a good price point because it's definitely helpful. I, I agree. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you for having me on. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.